<laughs> Good afternoon and welcome to each of you. My name is John Merkel and I have the pleasure of teaching theology here in the uh, College of St. Benedict, St. John's University Department of Theology and also of directing the J. Phillips Center for Interfaith Learning. And it is the J. Phillips Center that's sponsoring today's event. Um, we sponsor events like this, public events. We also have trips to houses of worship. And I want you to be on the lookout for a notice one of these days, maybe next week or so. We're going to put together a, a visit to a mosque in St. Cloud, which would be a nice accompaniment to this event. Yes. Welcome to uh, all of you, as I said, and Bishop Kettler, thank you so much for joining us today. I know you have a really busy schedule, and it's great to have you. So Not so much. <laughs> You're winding down, are you? <laughs> uh, um, well, a lot of people here have very busy schedules, but I think you've chosen very well to take some time out for this. I'm just going to introduce uh, my, or the J. Phillips Center's, one of, one of the J. Phillips Center's student interfaith leaders, Redate Lewy, who is right here to my right, who is going to take over after that. And um, Redate, you'll introduce the distinguished panelists then, okay? So Redate is a College of St. Benedict senior. She's a major in psychology, and very happily uh, for me, she's minoring in theology also. Um, she is a member of two really, well, three really distinguished honor societies, um, one of which she's co-president of the St. Ben's chapter, so of the Sai uh, Kai, Kai uh, uh, that's the Honor Society for the International um, Honor Society of, of Psychology. She's co-president of the chapter here, and she's also a member of Delta Epsilon Sigma and also Phi Beta Kappa, two very uh, difficult, uh, or two societies that it's very difficult to get into, so well, all three of them actually. Um, she was born and raised in Ethiopia until age 14, and then she moved to Tanzania, to Dar, Dar es Salaam, where she attended the International School of Tanganyika. And she has been a um, student interfaith leader and a very, a very distinguished and excellent one for the J. Phillips Center for the last three years. So, Redate, it's all yours. Thank you. Um, welcome, everybody. Today, we have two uh, panelists who are going to talk to us about their own faith traditions surrounding the topic of um, community. Ayan Omar uh, is an American Muslim refugee from Somalia. Um, she lives in St. Cloud right now with her husband and two daughters. And um, she's also a language arts educator at the St. Cloud Technical High School. And in 2017, she was one of seven people who were awarded the Outstanding Refugee Award from the Minnesota Department of Human Services. And she was cited for her civic um, leadership in, in the state. And um, she does a lot of presentations on Islam and the traumatic experiences of immigrant students in the United States. Um, she says her education and refugee background inspires her activism, uh, both locally and nationally. She also enjoys sharing how um, Islamic teachings and human decency are basically one and the same. So thank you, Ayan, for being here. We're very happy to have you. Um, you probably already know Father Michael. <laughs> he's um, one of us here. Um, he's a Bened He's been a oh, Benedict. <laughs> um, he's been a Benedictine monk since 1996, and he was first affiliated with um, Blue Cloud Abbey in Marvin, Saint, uh, South Dakota, until it closed in um, 2012, uh, and 
he transferred his monastic vows to St. John's Abbey. He's currently the Abbey's Oblate Director, as well as the CSB Sacramental um, Chaplain. Um, he also chairs the Board of um, Monastic Interreligious Dialogue, which is a group of Catholic monks and nuns who do interreligious dialogue with um, monks of other religions. He also regularly leads retreats as well as conferences. Um, and he serves in pastoral assignments throughout St. Cloud. And they've been both really active in the St. Cloud um, Christian Muslim dialogue, and we're very happy to have them here to discuss the topic of community. Absolutely. Thank you. So, Ayan, I'm going to start um, by asking you the first question. I know within the Muslim tradition, um, Ummah is the term for community. And I've heard that this term really stresses the ethical consciousness at the root of humankind. And I've also heard that not just the individual, but the whole community takes on a moral character to um, really um, cultivate our responsibility towards God. Um, how do you think about the connection between Ummah and uh, morality? And how is this cultivated through the through community? Sure. Um, first of all, I'm so happy to be here uh, alongside <coughs> Father, Father Michael. Uh, the way I understand Uma, which is actually uh, rooted in the same the, the same word as Umi, which is mom, mother. Uh, this idea that uh, it takes a village to uh, help a community progress, to build a community. And Islam uh, gives, <coughs> provides me uh, a guidebook, a moral guidebook of uh, how to achieve morality. And the way to achieve morality is investing in my community. And that means uh, charity, uh, uh, prayer, uh, anything that promotes the progress, uh, the health, uh, the justice system of my community is a way of fulfilling my personal duty as, as a Muslim. Uh, so th there is a, a close, uh, a very close correlation between morality, uh, community, and, and Islam, uh, because again, Islam is uh, when in Rome do as the Romans do, and, and do your part in civic duty, in, in leadership, uh, in volunteerism, taking care of the orphans, taking care of the sick. Um, I mean, just the five pillars of Islam requires me to invest in my community uh, and to do my part uh, so that we can pass <coughs> on the best to the next generation. Yeah. Um, can you give us examples of like specific practices that go into this cultivation of morality? Absolutely. Uh, one that I take a uh, whole personal that I was raised under is the idea of sharing uh, with others and, and learning. So through sharing, you learn. Um, so it, when, when you know better, you do better. Is, is the mentality. So uh, as a Muslim, as, as a young woman, my job is not to just know better and stay, sit at home and say, I'm taking care of my responsibilities and my duties, but rather to go out and, and share and learn and, and pass on that responsibility and that accountability to the next generation. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Father Michael, since you're a Benedictine monk, I'm going to focus on the rule of St. Benedict. Um, everything takes place within a community in, um, according to St. Benedict. And whether he's talking about prayer or work or whatever it may be, the disciple is reminded that he's part of or she is part of a community. So my first question for you is, how does work relate to cultivating uh, a community? Benedictine motto is ora et labora, uh, pray and pray and work. They come together in kind of a, a unified whole as one's, one's life. Um, I think as Benedictines, we're always seeing that work is not just producing something or, you know, the result of a lot of work and there it is, but the work is 
for the building up of the human person. So instead of work that is just cruel and, and crushing, a type of work that is good for the soul. So I'm just happy, at least in this Benedictine community, that we really enable our, our community members to foster different types of jobs and careers and ministries in their life. You see some of our elders who are in their 80s or 90s, and they've done everything. And that community has, has enabled that to happen, to be generative, to be, to be generous, um, to, be, to be good. Um, and I think work is seen that way as a positive thing. I mean, sometimes we see as work as something to get done with until I can move on to what's better. Um, you know, work is part of our life, it's varied, but as, as Benedictines, as part of our community, our main work is really prayer. Mm -hmm. Praying together as community. So, St. Benedict says when, you know, the, the bell goes off or the signal for prayer uh, rings, just leave it behind mm -hmm. and go pray with your community, your brothers. And that way there is no, like, absolute ownership or... Uh, tyranny of work, like I got to get this done, or mm. just leave it behind. Um, so productivity is important, but the human person is more important for the building up of the human person. If you have people, a community just making products and just results, you won't get a very peaceful community. But if you get a community of people who enjoy their jobs, are going to be fruitful and generative and generous to other people, that just makes happier people. Um, Another thing, kind of a, a story, uh, it's a, a little bit of a Buddhist story. So St. Benedict is also concerned with how things are done. So he writes in his rule that the tools of the monastery should be treated the same way as the sacred vessels of the altar. Mm -hmm. So the tools, the, the stuff, the things you use should be treated like the chalice and the plates at the Eucharist. That means that in the ordinary um, is sacred. So just mundane jobs like doing dishes. So the story is that there was this monk, uh, David, uh, Brother David Stendelrast, who took a retreat at a Buddhist monastery for a month. And they did meditation, but they also did chores. And they asked every participant to offer some sort of wisdom, and Brother David uh, above the dishwasher, he says, St. Benedict says that the dishes should be treated like the sacred vessels of the altar. Sacred. Doing dishes is a sacred act. So I guess a few months later, he went to a different Buddhist, monast different Buddhist uh, retreat center in a different state, and he walked in the door, and somebody there says, Oh, you're Brother David the dishwasher. <laughs> so... So for Benedict, I think the, the work is considered sacred because it's, it's giving um, and ordinary is sacred also. Yeah. What other specific practices are really important in cultivating a strong and stable community? Certainly attitude. Um, one of my brother monks who lives here, uh, who I respect uh, very much and love very much, uh, was in uh, missions in Guatemala for 40 years, you know, just real hard time, uh, Father Bernadine. And he remains, to me, one of the most naturally happy people I've ever met. And I said, Bernie, you know, you've had a tough life, given yourself, uh, how did you do it all those years? And still, like, really just positive, optimistic, happy. Um, and I remember this. He says, well, Mike, have this, well, he said, I let this attitude, this symbol be for me uh, 40 years ago. So he said, let this symbol be yours. Open hands. He says, if your hands are open, you can give and receive friendship and love from others, broadening that community. And uh, he says, Mike, don't live a life with this. Close fists, or like this, stubborn open hands. So I think the attitude of generally openness towards what God has called you to do and the people that God has 
has placed within you. That's very beautiful. That's, if you don't mind me adding, that's pretty interesting because uh, in, in my faith, uh, the fourth pillar of Islam is charity. Mm -hmm. uh, and as a Muslim, I'm required to give 2.5% of my net worth to charity. But an alternative to that, to that is smiling. So if you are unable to give uh, monetary or money, smiling at your brothers and your sisters is a form of charity. So happiness, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Cultivating. Yeah. You see a lot more of that nowadays with spring here. Yeah. It's easier. <laughs> it's easier. It is easier. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Thank you both for sharing. That's yeah. beautiful. Um, moving on to our next question. I'm gonna. You brought up one of the pillars. I'm going to talk about the other, um, another pillar, which is the pilgrimage to Mecca. So you're encouraged to do it at least once in your life. Um, and it's a very powerful symbol of community, like doing the Hajj with the rest of um, your fellow um, Muslims, basically. And it transcends cultural and national barriers. And Islam is one of the most diverse religions in the world. Um, but there is that unity of you know, being under the same faith. Um, how do you see this diversity and unity playing out in your local community? Like, are there um, challenges associated and like um, benefits? What are the two sides of that? Sure. Uh, so just to, uh, just to inform everyone, so the, the, the five pillars, the very first one is proclamation of faith. Uh, then you have prayers, which we pray five times a day at a certain time of the day. Uh, and then you have fasting, or the month of Ramadan, which is in uh, mid-April this year. Uh, and that's where you abstain from food from sunup to sundown. Um, it's, it's a rigorous version of Lent, is how I describe <laughs> it. Um, and then, and then, you have, then you have charity followed by a pilgrimage. If you are financially or physically capable, you are called to make pilgrimage to Mecca, which is one of our holy sites. Uh, we have Me Mecca, Medina, and Jerusalem, so the three holy sites. Uh, the way I, I look at unity and di diversity in, in my faith, uh, first, I, I always tell everyone, uh, all Muslim people aren't Arab. They're, they're, they're not of African descent. They're not Middle Eastern. Uh, Muslims across the world come in different shapes, different sizes, different colors, different backgrounds, and different stories. Um, but what unites us, is, is, besides the five pillars, is, is something that can divide us, and it's this uh, reason, the, the ability to reason, the ability to seek knowledge, the ability to learn, uh, also causes some conflict. Um, what, what, what I've noticed is when I go to the mosque in, in St. Cloud, that for, for my daily prayers, for that five minutes, I am in, in a room full of people who, who, who pray like I do. And that inspires me, and it empowers me, and it, it, it gives me a, a new, it re-energizes me. Uh, and that's unity. We're united fi five times a day. We're, we're praying at a particular time. Uh, but in, in, the, in the process of seeking knowledge or reasoning, we come across things that may somehow cause conflict uh, personally, in, in my Somali culture, the idea of tribalism uh, is, is something that causes us conflict just because we all have different ideas of uh, tri tribes and clanism which contributed to so much of what happened in our, in our country. Uh, but we're slowly shedding that. With every generation, we're slowly shedding uh, the conflicts and focusing on, on the diversity of thought, the diversity of education. Uh, I, I'm in a group with, we call it the Somali Professional Women's Group. We have nurses, we have doctors, therapists, teachers, uh, and we, we all come with different narratives. Our, our journey to America is completely different. Um, the, some of us recite the Quran in English, some of us recite it in Arabic, some of us do it in Somali. So we, we have our different ways of practices, 
but we're still united in the fundamentals of faith uh, and community and, and progress in, in contributing to, to community. Yeah, I mean, I was able to notice, I mean, we have some of the same parallels in, in the Catholic tradition. It's a very universal and, and diverse faith, and we, we don't exactly say the Mass at the exact same time, but we do it on the same day, so there is a sense of like empowerment that comes from, from that, but um, also acknowledging like our, the beauty and differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. I think that's one easy entry of dialogue between Benedictines and Muslims. Here right now, there's a call to prayer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's right. <laughs> so Benedictines are just, it's in our DNA to pray uh, many times a day. At St. John's we pray four times a day. Some Benedictine communities, seven. Uh, I think we're required to at least pray four. So just mm. that, that, that connection. call of worship, there it is. Hmm. I'm excused from prayer this time. <laughs> <laughs> I said a little prayer when I, <laughs> the bell started going off. So um, <laughs> that leads nicely into our next question. So returning to the Benedictine tradition, can you speak a little bit about your own experience following the rule of St. Benedict and how you define good community? You kind of touched on this in your first question, but mm -hmm. mm, kind of bringing it to your own personal experience. Yeah. A, a good community and, and uh, good just in relation to um, the rule of St. Benedict. Yeah. Well, I think a, a Benedictine community is like every, f really a family. We have different personalities. We go through tough times. We go through, we go through good times. Um, I think generally one of the, how I define a good community member, and God, God knows the heart, so <laughs> I don't see the, the inside of my brothers. Um, the ones that I always appreciate are the ones that are easily approachable. Just that are generous, that you can approach them and you don't have to go through any booby traps or sand pits. You'll, you don't have to find them at the right time, but they're just easily just generous and, and, and there for a person. And that kind of fosters com community. Obviously, we're, you're not having people who are just mm -hmm crossing their, their arms and resistance. Yeah, and earlier we kind of talked about specific practices that go into like um, building the community, but as an individual, like um, working on your own inner life, how, how can we work to be like um, healthier and more active community members as, as Benedictines? I think as Benedictines, we, we have a sense of that hospitality where we try to broaden our community. It's not just the guys with funny clothes, <laughs> um, but to be that fundamental like open hands and openness. Uh, I might have told this story, I think, when uh, Brother Jyoti Paolo and I were here last, but uh, um, just maybe tell the story again in case I uh, told it. Well, good stories are worth retelling. Yes. <laughs> yes. So one of the examples of building community and broadening uh, community happened actually at my former monastery, Blue Cloud Abbey in South Dakota. It's, what, 150 miles from here, a very rural uh, community. And it was about 9 at night, and rural enough community where it's quiet at night, not like here, <laughs> mm -hmm. where it's wonderfully active here. So I was getting some coffee or some tea, and I heard this angry voice coming down the hallway, walking towards me, swearing. It, it wasn't one of my brothers, I could tell. <laughs> and I was wondering what to do with myself, like run or call the cops. <laughs> um, so I was just basically frozen. And one of my brothers, Father Thomas Wisnowski, um, just walked right past me, walked up to this man, and he says, hi, I'm Father Tom. Are you hungry? Mm -hmm. And this guy was just taken aback. And he said, well, yeah. And so Father Tom and this angry man went to the kitchen, got some food out and you know, nuked it and put things together. And I came back a half an hour, 45 minutes later to see if Father Tom was still alive. <laughs> uh, it, was, it was nice to see because angry man had turned into laughing man. Mm. Like, ha ha, Father, I just, thank you. I just needed that. And, uh, Father Tom said, 
you know, I needed that also. Mm -mm. And there was just kind of a, a unity and a, mutual, a mutuality that I just see as a as, as wonderful quality of, of the best of Benedictine hospitality is that fundamental open to the other, even when it, it's, yeah. I, I mean, I froze. Mm -hmm. uh, you learn a lot from failures, don't you? Uh, so, like building community, it's just a, because there's a failure doesn't mean that you can't try and, yeah, sure. you know. Try again. Yep. You'll so I think somebody who is just, just receptive to others is good. Yeah. You kind of pointed um, towards like um, appreciating like the strength in, in your brother monk. And I want to ask you like how does a Benedictine community really um, emphasize different talents and gifts that community members have and how is that really um, uplifted? Well, it's a relief that I don't have to do everything. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> or, or be everything. Um, for instance, that weakness in me, that failure of me to not receive the guest was supplemented by Father Tom, who, who knew how to do that, whose gifts were there. Um, so that, that recognizing the giftedness, uh, being grateful for others' giftedness is an important thing. I think sometimes with what can be destructive community to community, um, not necessarily monastic community, but just like a college community or a family or whatnot, is just, just being envious. Mm. You know, I, I hear a lot from that from students, like, gosh, I wish I was that, that smart, or I wish I had as much money as their family did, or had good grades. Um, but being grateful for, for others' talents while just recognizing that God has given you a, a, lot, of, a lot of talents, and to be able to, to give um, uniquely what God has given to you to be, to be generous and not to, not to hold back, I think it's just really fundamental to our, our happiness. Gratefulness for oneself, for one's giftedness, and just not, uh, not being stingy. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so now I'm going to start asking you questions that are shared so you can take turns however sure. you'd like sure. in answering them. Um, but I, I want you both to answer all of the questions I ask now. Um, Communities have a tendency to separate um, themselves from, from others. And a prominent example I can think of is just segregated school cafeterias, right? That could be racially or religious affiliation-wise. Wise. So um, my first question is, is there ever a benefit to um, want to be with your own um, group and to share like that important identity? So um, sometimes we might not see the benefit to that. So are there any benefits? I, I do see some benefits uh, with, I don't know, for the lack of better terms, sticking with your own. Uh, and I, I, pr preservation, uh, uh, sustaining your, your religion, your culture, and uh, your narrative. It is, it's important that you're, you can feed off of those who are like you. Right? Uh, to learn from the elders. Uh, my favorite place in the world to go to is my mom's house. <laughs> uh, just to sit, sit with her and, and hear her stories and uh, just remember where I came from and, and who I am, uh, just in the busyness of my life with teaching, parenting, um, going to school. I tend to forget all of that. Uh, so uh, any opportunity that I, I can get, I get to be at my mom's house or to go to the mosque to, uh, as I said earlier, to re-energize, just to be in solidarity uh, with, with those who look like me. Um, so the, the benefit, there are benefits to it, um, but there are also errors, right? Errors with just sticking with your own. Uh, and I, I always say the dangers lie in monopoly, right? This idea that my culture, my religion is superior. Mm -hmm. uh, the group that I'm with is better than the group next door. Uh, no, I always say no one culture, no one religion 
uh, has a monopoly on virtues. <laughs> we all have the ability to be kind. We all have the ability uh, to know right from wrong. Uh, and, and if we're able to find a corner, uh, whether uh, even a coffee shop, where we can somehow share that or spend time with each other, uh, it, it helps. It helps contribute back to the children yeah. that there isn't one way to be right. There isn't one way to be good. Uh, that you can all uh, adapt your own way and in turn um, share it. And, and that's something that Muhammad, peace be upon him, promoted. Uh, the Sunnah, so the, we have the Quran, that's the, uh, the holy book is the Quran, and then the Sunnah uh, is basically equivalent to the Catechism. It, it shows us how Muhammad lived his life. And one of the things that, uh, that I recall reading when I was young is Muhammad encouraged us not to, f to blindly follow tradition, to not blindly follow, do things a certain way just because that's how it's been done. Um, because our parents did it that way or our, our great-grandparents did it that way. Uh, because their errors or, or their virtues are now ours to, to adapt, to uh, live, and then pass it on to the next. So there's no monopoly in, in good or bad, mm -hmm. but there are also benefits to sticking with, with your own. Sometimes, too, when we, with two different religions that could be similar but also different, we can, I forget who said this, but we can compare our best to their worst. Mm. We got Mother Teresa, who do you have? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. But that, you know, just the experience of like being in a Christian place of worship and, and being at a mosque. You know, when I visited the mosque a, f a few times, um, well, once I made a boo-boo. It was, I kind of walked in with my shoes on. <laughs> yeah. Then they were like, whoop, what? <laughs> so I had to take my shoes off quick, but I, I learned after, after that. And just entering into this space where Muslims were worshiping, it was real. I didn't, I, I didn't know how to enter in besides with respect and pray in my own type of, of, of prayer. So I saw it as real, but something that I just couldn't do. I mean, um, I didn't know how, how to do it, and, and it would just be uh, a bad move interreligiously just to kind of do everything you're doing. Mm -hmm. um, but I saw it as real. And you, you, our Muslim Christian prayer group, uh, we begin with prayer. Mm -hmm. Like a Christian prayer and a Muslim prayer, and then a lot of times it's just spontaneous. We where we pray together for each other's needs, and that's that's real. I mean, the language is more general, like Creator God, or you know, we don't do it through Jesus' name, or mm -hmm. <laughs> it's respectful that way. But it's it's real prayer. It's real. Um, in what's more familiar with me, uh, I think, like the the Abbey Church. It was a place of ritual. You know, I've, I've been in the Abbey Church. I've seen monks make their monastic vows there. We've had funerals of, of monks. I presided over the weddings of Bettings, Bennies, and Johnnies. Uh, and for those of you Catholics, the Lord be with you. <laughs> See? <laughs> it's, it's easier that way, but, you know, I... I it's, it's, for me, it's a both, it has to be a both end. Mm -hmm. I guess there's our experiences where it's naturally, you go maybe deeper into your own tradition. Um, but then if you're siloed and you protect yourself and you think I'm right and you're wrong, mm -hmm. you know, we get into a type of religious certainty which is just too certain. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm right, you're wrong, shut up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes our belief in God can move from mystery just to certainty. Um, not that we can't be sure of the things, but I am sure also of, that you pray for real. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a beautiful way to put it. And 
um, as you mentioned, you're both part of the same interreligious group. And one thing I want to ask you, since you've been doing this work, is what are recommendations that you have, especially, you know, with working um, within the Saint Cloud community specifically? But it could be um, you could think on the national level as well. But what are some specific recommendations to kind of um, bridge that that difference or that segregation? I think uh, um, talk to strangers. You know, we're told not to do that growing up. Certain situations, maybe it's probably best not to. Uh, but there's probably more opportunities to talk to strangers than we uh, realize. And those strangers could be um, somebody different. Um, so talking to strangers, St. Benedict has a type of spirituality uh, that's he's very positive when it comes again to the stranger. So he, in his chapter on the, the porter of the monastery, so the porter is like the receptionist, the person who's at the front door who welcomes the strangers first. So he says that the porter shouldn't wander around. He should be ready to welcome the strangers. And when the stranger, you know, Knocked on the do knocks on the door, the first thing the porter should say is, thanks be to God. Yeah. Why does he say that? Because in the Benedictine and certainly the Catholic tradition was very sacramental where God is present in the human person. The words of Christ, I was a stranger and you welcomed me, are literal, are powerful, uh, and strong. And so the stranger is, at least for the Benedictine and the, the Catholic, um, the person of Christ. So if that porter doesn't say thanks be to God or doesn't open the door, then the porter is missing the face of God. Mm -hmm. So, um, and also, but just one more thing. Go for it. <laughs> I, maybe bringing it down a little bit more practical too. I think one practice is just the people you meet, let your kind of default thought be. I wish that person happy, mm. just happy. You know, when you're, when you're wishing somebody happiness, not, not happiness according to what I think they should be like, but just, just happy. Um, if you're wishing somebody happy, it's hard to wish somebody ill mm. at the same time, mm -hmm. so. I'm, I'll feed off of that yeah, and yeah. Um, talk to strangers. Uh, don't settle for books to learn about your neighbor, right? right. Uh, I find people will often ask me, what's a good book to learn about Islam? Mm -hmm. um, and, Ayan Omar. Yeah, <laughs> you can talk to me. <laughs> um, don't settle for, uh, reading is trivial, right? Uh, you can only learn so much, uh, but you could probably get more out of talking to a person. Uh, I, I did a TED talk about the face value, right? The, the, the narrative that is invested in someone's facial expressions that you can't get out of a book. Uh, the, ex the smile, uh, the nonverbal cues, uh, the ability to learn from someone that's standing in front of you. So uh, talk to a stranger, ask a question, um, and, and believe that we have more in common than different. Uh, that has to be a fundamental belief that as human beings, I mean, all the psychology books tell us, tell us this, sociology tells us this, that we all have a need for love and belonging, right? Uh, we, we all have, we all want the best for, for our family. We all want the best for ourselves. Uh, if, if, if anything else, talk to a stranger on a human level. Um, know that we're all in this journey of healing uh, and no one is the exception, right? Um, I come from the Horn of Africa. I come from a, a torn, a civil war torn country. Uh, however, I can sit here and I can guarantee you that I have the same concerns sitting here today that you, most of you do. Um, so on a human level, talk to a stranger 
Uh, put all differences aside, you'll find that we connect on so many different things besides what our books tell us. There's a lot of things going on in the St. Cloud area too. Mm -hmm. Unite Cloud, um, Bethlehem Lutheran Church in St. Cloud is putting on the next, well last Sunday and then this coming Sunday, next Sunday, um, what is entitled, Can We Do More Than Pray? Where it just talks about right. bringing people together to help one another rather than I'll pray for you, which is yeah. prayer is obviously fundamental, important, but putting skin on that. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's, there's things going on. Just, you know, Google it. You can yeah. find everything. If you want to become part of a group that's maybe a little bit more safe, if you don't know, well, how can I talk to a stranger? Mm -hmm. Then maybe there's things going on around where it gives you a safe or better environment mm -hmm. um, to be more active. Yeah. Yeah. And, and just one more thing, and, and this is something I just started saying more and more, uh, even with my own family, is don't compromise your faith for political gain, right? Uh, and so much is going on, but at the end, uh, if, if I look at uh, Father Michael, if I look at my own upbringing, uh, faith at the root of our existence definitely brings us together more so than divides us. Mm -hmm. But you don't have to be afraid of differences. No. So, I mean, so if... I'm a Christian and I'm pretty much orthodox Christian, can recite the Nicene Creed and believe it. Mm -hmm. You know, I shouldn't give that up if I'm trying to yeah. share. No. Uh, so it's again that both, both end of, paradoxically, the, the deeper you go in your own tradition, it doesn't make every other tradition completely wrong. Right. You could just at least be in, open to see that other traditions are deep also. Mm -hmm. Uh, if that makes sense. Accepting so. it. And I, I second your suggestion of just Google it because our, our generation is um, yeah. very much, <laughs> you know, we get our information through our phones and through our laptops. So right. um, there are a lot of opportunities. You can also come to the J. Phillips Center and ask us for suggestions. So we're happy to give them to you. Um, we live in a world of consumerism um, and sometimes it there can be a great deal of emphasis on the needs of the individual. Um, so my question for you is, in a world that's so obsessed with the self, how can we balance the, the care for, for the individual with um, cultivating community? How do we reach that perfect balance? Because you can't ignore the, the self, you can't ignore the community. How do we balance the two? Uh. Do you want to go first? Or? Sure, sure. The gears are working. <laughs> uh, I, was, Thanks. Uh, I was raised uh, in a family of 12. Um, we lived in a three-bedroom, two-bathroom. My sisters and I, we shared a bedroom. Um, if you didn't go to bed on time, you had to sleep on the floor. Uh, things like that. And, I, and I'm going to go back to uh, the family structure as the best way to counter consumerism, uh, the, fun, the, the values of family. And it could be because I have two daughters, uh, but I, uh, routines such as sitting at home, uh, having dinner together, um, spending time with, with one another. Um, my, when my daughter comes home from, work, uh, from school, not work, she's a <laughs> kindergartner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we sit at the table and we, we just share how our day went. Um, promoting marriage, uh, Islam sees marriage just as Catholicism does as a sacred uh, duty. So uh, promoting marriage, promoting family values, uh, and, and I think Father Michael touched on this, somehow eliminating this concept of comparison. Right. I think you talked about not comparing what I have with, you know, the idea of keeping up with the Joneses. That uh, I can instill in my daughter that you're not going to do everything Becky at school does. Uh, you're not going to have everything she has. It's just the reality of it. Um, but we could, what we, what we could do at home is, is promote respect, self-respect. That you can have what you have. Um, and I can have what I have or don't have is just perfectly fine. This idea of accepting everyone um, 
is very important. Promoting family is very important. Going back to sitting at the table and just more face-to-face -face conversations is going to be the way to move away from this self, uh, this self consumerism that we have going on right now. <clears throat> One phrase I, I like to say is, uh, um, create more than you consume. Mm. Create more than you consume to create, a, to create community, cr to create links, to create art or, or, or music. St. Benedict's rule is about 1,500 years old, so it's had a few centuries to be tested, and I think it's popular, especially because it, it really subtly addresses that, that concern. Is it about the individual, mm -hmm. or is it about the community? And the answer is yes. And Benedict is mindful that all his monks are different. Mm -hmm. They have different needs and talents, and, and he's trying to help them be happier. Uh, the thing that Benedict does not like is grumbling, mm -hmm. people murmuring, mm -hmm. complaining. And that can come by legitimate reasons that people's needs aren't being taken care of as, as, as individuals. Um, Benedict is also cautious about, you know, if you've got your needs taken care of, you, we still grumble, can't we? Don't grumble because, you know, God is sufficient for you in this present moment. The, your monks are probably sufficient for you at this present moment. You have every reason to be thankful and grateful. Mm. Uh, but he says to the individual, you know, um, don't be obstinate in your needs. You know, you're not the center of the world. Mm. Um, so, I mean, if you emphasize community too much, then the individual just disappears. We, we've seen some governments do that. And if you emphasize the, the individual too much, you get, I think what we're experiencing in the United States is loneliness and, and depression. And mm -hmm. so I think that coming back to community and linking people together is so, so. important. And that happens as in, in our own family. Mm -hmm. In our own community, those closest to us are going to be the deepest part of our life. So I, life. I remember when I was uh, in a hurry, and I, I have a challenge with this being in a hurry, going from thing to thing. Uh, just off the monastic dining room downstairs is a little snack room where you can, if you need to, if you can't eat with the community, and eating with community, eating together is important, you can just grab like soup and eat, eat, eat gone. And I was in this snack room and just, you know, standing up, eating a bowl of, oh, it's just my stomach just growled. <laughs> eating, yeah. eating a bowl of soup and an elderly, elderly monk, he looks at me, he says, you know, Michael, that's not a very Benedictine way to eat. <laughs> he said, uh, sit down and tell me about what's going on with you. And my first thought was like, I'm standing, I'm eating quickly, doesn't he see this? And my Minnesota nice kicked in, darn it. And so I sat down and it was a wonderful conversation. So this taking time with people, mm. enjoying company, maybe saying no to a few projects so you can have that time is, is, is so important. Um, Better also emphasizes listening, um, to really, really respectfully listen to the others. And <clears throat> when he calls community together, for a meeting, uh, for a community discussion. He says, you know, invite especially the younger monks because God actually most likely speaks to them the most. I mean, being in a community where the young can change things. Yes. Um, and that, so Benedict wants the whole community there because God can speak often to, in surprising ways. Uh, and the young, and I feel really blessed being part of a, a community that's a multi-generational community. So we have monks here from age, uh, we don't have kids, mm -hmm. surprise, <laughs> age 26 through um, 97. Do you, uh, do you babysit or no? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. I don't babysit. Well, actually, I, our novice, uh, Jeremy, I, was, uh, we voted on him to become a novice. Uh, last fall, and I realized when our novice master was introducing Jeremy for our vote that his mom is my age. 
Yeah, so uh, wherever I, I hope I didn't <laughs> go off a little bit. So. No. Um, I think it's a very important reminder for at least college students. I think we're always kind of running from one thing to the other. So I think it's a very important reminder to end on just to like um, take the time to, to be with our friends, um, professors, our community at large. But I do want to open it up to audience questions. Um, so feel free, there are two mics on the left and on the right, so you can come up and ask your questions. Now I can see you while I ask hey, the question. Uh, <laughs> um, I'm Sabrina. I'm a junior here at St. Ben's. Um, and I actually have a question for Ayan. Um, so I am a future teacher. And I know with your prayer, your scheduled prayer, is something that I have been trying to work into my life a little bit more as well, making sure that I get a daily prayer, daily time with the Bible. Um, how do you work that around your busy teacher schedule? I mean, it's <laughs> I know it's absolutely crazy, and so I'd, I'd just love to hear. Oh, absolutely. Um, so gr growing up, uh, my father, there's only one daily prayer that runs into the school schedule. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I'm, talk I'm thinking about the teaching schedule, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And growing up, my father always said, you can pray at home. When you come home, you can pray. Uh, the idea of praying at a specific time is to promote discipline, mm -hmm. uh, is to, promote, to keep that uh, collective or communal feeling that's so uh, prevalent in, in Islam. Uh, however, you can also pray at home if, if, if you have to. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, pray, prayer is, is a form of meditation. Uh, it's an opportunity to spend about five, mi five minutes or so with God just to kind of lay all my you know, troubles and just walk away from it. So I, I tend to modify until I get home. I'll just do, read a few surahs. Uh, just take five minutes, close my door, uh, pray five minutes of the day, uh, just meditate and, and just ask, remember God is what I do. But the, the physical routine of prayer, I, I wait till I get home. Great, thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah, that, just if I may, so really just, uh, that's so important, I really feel blessed to be in a monastic community where at 7, 12, 5, and 7, if I go down to church, 92 steps from my room, I'm not going to be the only one there. So it's, it's, it's a great support to pray with other people and um, people who are able to pray in, like in, the, in the Christian way to have that discipline. You know, I, I just, it is a discipline. Mm -hmm. Really, that's, yes. so I think those time periods where in the Christian context we talk about liturgy, the hours. Mm -hmm. So hours like morning prayer, noon prayer, evening prayer, Compline. Compline is a night prayer. Mm -hmm. Good night, God. Mm -hmm. um, is so important, uh, rather than just kind of getting it in. Uh, I think that's, that's something I, at least with the Friends of the Benedictines, uh, are really I, I see as, as putting, excuse me, not being articulate, uh, some of the Friends of the Abbey who have maybe experienced liturgy hours and praying with the monks have incorporated uh, it to their own, and just seeing that that's really just fundamental and really really more important than the actual, the, the physical, yeah. yeah. So. Go for it. Whenever. There you go. Could you tell me, uh, uh, in very general terms, uh, how does the Somali community feel about the reception by the St. Cloud community? Uh, the, the reception, I, I, I don't want to speak for all Somali people, but uh, it's, it's been a change for both sides, right? Uh, you have two worlds that are colliding in a way who are just learning about one another. Uh, and St. Cloud has for a long time been uh, just one demographic. 
Uh, so the, the change uh, has been difficult. Uh, however, it, it is going in a, good di in a wonderful direction of understanding, uh, building uh, different groups that are able to go out into the community. Uh, for example, there are more young educated Somali uh, second generation uh, children like myself who are putting themselves in that position of uh, sharing their narrative, of that, that they're putting themselves in, in such a discomfort because they understand that this is the only way the wider community is going to hear about the, the, their people. Uh, it, it, it's a responsibility that we're starting to accept. Uh, as, as young second generation because our parents aren't able to do it for themselves. Um, and again, we're second generation, but there are new to country uh, families that have been here maybe four or five months or within the last year. Uh, so we're doing more for one another. Uh, we're cultivating our own community to help the new transition into, into St. Cloud. So the reception for me personally, and I've lived here since 1993 and I grew up in Atlanta, Georgia, but I grew up in a predominantly African American community. So language was the only barrier I had for 12 years of my life. And then I moved up to St. Cloud and it was more of a race, uh, culture, religion, uh, so many things that I really did not concern myself with down in Georgia became a factor in, in becoming an American all over again. So that, that was difficult for me. I can only imagine what it, would, what it is for those who are just coming uh, to America. But there are more educated individuals who are willing to take that on, and I see that more and more. That's a this may be oversimplistic, but for myself, who's a fourth generation American, my great grandparents, Hans and Olga Kolden, <laughs> came over from Lom, Norway. Never really learned English, but bought 260 acres of farmland just south of Morris, Minnesota. Uh, I'm the first generation to go to, to, go to college, so it. it, oh. it, it <laughs> For those of us, for those people who want things to integrate in, right. Rosh, there's still, <laughs> this takes, takes time. generations that it takes, you know, uh, I still have some of my Norwegian background, and I hope, you know, the generations of Somalis and other immigrants can somehow hold their cultural um, traditions mm -hmm. close to themselves. I know that's a, a challenge between just complete integration and um, and holding on traditions, and mm -hmm. it's, it's a dynamic I, I see. So, so Ayan, how do you see that the little kids doing in the schools here, in the public schools? Are, is there some real integration going on, or does everybody stick to themselves? How does it um, go? Well, in the cafeteria, you, you know, you, you, you stick with what you know and who you know. Um, and, and that's really no, nothing, nothing new. I mean, the Irish did it, the Italians did it. You know, you tend to stick with what you know and who you know. Uh, but in the schools, I, I see uh, more, more and more kids will, will come to me and ask me, well, how'd you do it? Like, how did you become a teacher? Uh, I have EL students that will just come to my room during my lunch just to have a conversation about my story. They're just, they're hungry for that, uh, someone to tell them that it is possible, that this is, this is the route I took. Uh, this is, I, I mowed it down for you. You just have to walk the same, uh, the same uh, trail and you'll be fine. But I'm seeing more and more curiosity of what do I have to do? What do I need to do? Um, so there is that willingness, uh, but it's like Father Michael just said, it, it's going to take a while because you just don't learn English <laughs> within a day. Uh, it took me, it wasn't until sixth grade until they said, okay, you don't need 
English language learner service anymore. And I was devastated <laughs> because I didn't feel that I was ready. I was like, uh, in fact, I remember failing all of seventh grade because uh, in, in spite of, I was like, well, you don't kick me out of EL Learner. Um, but then after seventh grade, I, I, I started to earn, um, I started performing better. Uh, so I, I tell the kids, you know, it, it'll take some time, but they are eager, they have that desire, they want to be part of uh, the community, uh, but it is, I, re I remember it, it's, it's easy to get discouraged and say, I'll never get it, I'll never understand Shakespeare, I, I don't understand Shakespeare and I'm a teacher, but it, <laughs> it's so easy for them to, to say that, but there is that eagerness to keep going. I'm kind of glad there was a couple people to ask the questions, you know, just to get comfortable. Mm -hmm. but, and I did fail the seventh grade, so we have something in common. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Uh, so, I, like so I wanted to ask something in just particular. So when I lived in Greeley, Colorado, I had the perspective of like, when I was with the Somali community and also doing cross country and getting to see the other side of other families and how they did their culture, their families. So. My question in particular is, you know, in many religions, you tend to just focus on it and really get in depth and, you know, really get to see the other side of, you know, maybe the Benedict value or the life of Jesus and other things such as that. So I wanted to ask, in your personal opinions, do you think it would be a benefit for um, the Muslim community to learn more about Christianity and vice versa? Yes. Uh, to, I mean, personally, um, that has, has contributed so much to my life. But you're right, I had the same upbringing. Uh, however, my father comes from an educated background, so we had the Torah, the Bible, and the Quran at home. My father was more of a, if you have a question, go pick up a book and find the answer. Um, you're not going to get a summary <laughs> of Judaism. He wouldn't give us that uh, benefit. But uh, we were so, uh, we're so engrossed in our own faith. My father taught us to, we were to memorize the Quran, we were to understand the Quran. Um, it's like we had to be at a certain point before we hit 18. And it was just everything, it consumed us. Um, and and part, part of that, I, I believe, is because uh, so much of Somali people, I guess I can speak only for my family, uh, is attributed to faith. So the reason we made it out of the war is because uh, Islam. The reason we survived is because of Islam. So so much of who we are is attributed to Islam that there, you, there's no seeing anything outside of that, right? Uh, and the downside of that is it's not till you get to 30, I'm 30, uh, that you start to say, it's okay to look outside and learn about Jesus. Uh, and, uh, because Islam talks about Jesus, but you don't understand Jesus the way my, Father Michael understands Jesus. Uh, because you, know, you can only read it in the Quran, but as soon as you meet someone who believes and, uh, and is walking and trying to uh, walk in the same path, it, it's, it's a whole different light. Uh, I, I will tell you why it's harder for Somali people to want to come to a place like this and want to learn about. Uh, it's because they're minority. They feel that they have a lot to lose. They feel that they're under, under a telescope. Mm -hmm. They feel that uh, they're afraid to say the wrong thing. They're afraid <coughs> that people might have their minds made up of who they are, and people aren't genuinely interested in dialogue, but more so either conversion or to prove their assumptions about who they are. So fear, once again, uh, is attributing to the lack of, uh, I've invited people in, in my community, but as you can see, there's that hesitation and I don't think we'll get there till maybe second or third generation, I would say third generation Somali. 
uh, <clears throat> happy to see some of the churches, Protestant, Catholic, uh, in the area, have education degrees like the, under the title, like, My Neighbor is Muslim, and having uh, Muslim or Muslims come to their churches, and, and again, you can read all sorts of things. You can read good books about Islam, uh, you can read bad stuff, mm -hmm. uh, you know, written by trolls, where uh, else you can meet a human person. So I think both education, learning about the faith, but also seeing that faith embodied is so important. I was happy that John had mentioned something about the J. Phillips visiting uh, a mosque. Um, and when I enter places of worship, as I said before, whether a mosque or uh, a temple or a Buddhist monastery, that's, that's at least for me, it was like, aha, yes. I, I can understand this, at least a, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, majority, um, humility. A little humility is, 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 is needed. A little less arrogance, a little bit more openness to learning about the other, both really educating oneself and then being open to the, to the other. So um, if you're in particular faith communities, maybe encourage you to think about something about having my neighbor as Muslim. Um, the Lutheran Social Services have has, has a nice kind of free PDF called My Neighbor is Muslim that's downloadable. That's a nice free kind of resource as a, as a, as a tool for your faith, mm -hmm. faith community. Yep. And I'm teaching my third. Yep. Uh, at Sacred Heart Church, so it's the third My Neighbor is a Muslim. Yep. Um, I did at United Methodist Church in Sartell. I was at Little Falls before that, and at Sacred Heart Church now. Mm -hmm. Do we have any other audience questions? Go ahead. Hi. Uh, so I think most of you guys are talking about to be like open mind and to be respectful to others, but I still have the feeling like, oh, I like this guy, but I don't like this guy because of so much relationship going on around us. Then could I get any advice to deal with those kind of feelings? With like somebody you don't like or? Yeah, like to deal with like to open mind to everyone. To, like, because I don't want to have like the feeling to be like specific person, but I don't like this person. Like, can I, like, yeah. how can I deal with those feelings? Um, it's yeah. probably a natural tendency in all of us to like yeah. or, or not, maybe not like other people. So mm -hmm. we're not going to be liking um, everyone, you know, yeah. equally. So it's just like a natural friendship, those you're uh, attracted with. You know, St. Benedict says that we are to have the utmost patience for those weaknesses of both mind and body of, of other people. Um, so it's just more patience with people. Um, I guess for uh, at least the Christian perspective, maybe so also with the Muslim perspective, I should know this, but um, fundamentally we believe that since everybody is made in the image of God, that everybody is worth that type of respect. Uh, which can help when personalities are kind of getting in the way, uh, that other people are fundamentally sacred and holy. Maybe that's up here, but I, th I think if we think about that, that people are not just a collection of their personalities that annoy us, to have patience and just realize just everybody's worth respect, just who they are even regardless of how they act. Mm -hmm. uh, I was at Holding Ford uh, several weeks ago, and I did a training for some of the teachers there. And uh, a young teacher came up to me and asked, she said, what fills your bucket? And it's the first time I've ever heard that, what fills your bucket? Uh, and I thought, well, um, and then she said, how do you continue to have this open mind? What, what gives you hope? Uh, and I said to her, you know, 
for me, is finding comfort in my own discomforts, right? Mm -hmm. uh, knowing that I am not perfect. Uh, I, am, I have my own flaws. Uh, I have my own problems. Uh, and everyone is walk, walking around with a similar story, right? Uh, so uh, an advice to you would be, one, find a way to be comfortable with your own discomforts. If you're afraid to meeting new, if you're afraid of meeting new people, just tell yourself, "I'm afraid of meeting new people." Uh, as long as, as the sooner you say it out loud, it becomes real, and you don't, you're not afraid of it anymore, right? And and you become comfortable in vulnerability, mm -hmm. uh, and and as soon as you can do that, because, boy, I've been in places where I I've received some pretty accusatory questions. But I, rather than hearing the question, I see the person, right? I, I see that, that that is a person who is just on a journey of life, and somewhere they were misinformed or they heard something that is inaccurate to my existence. So rather than judging them or saying, you're wrong, uh, you have to learn to uh, be comfortable with your discomfort, uh, be OK vulner with vulnerability, uh, and see human, see human be beyond uh, beyond any any judgment that you might want to impose on anyone. Uh, I think that will help in under yeah. in, in being open mind. Other otherwise, the the counter is pretty pretty sad. <laughs> yeah, that's very that's good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, Thank you very much, everybody, for coming here. And I want to thank Ayan and Father Michael for um, spending time with us and sharing your wisdom. We were really happy to have you. Um, just keep in mind that we'll be um, announcing when and where our visit will be. Uh, you're always welcome at the J. Phillips Center, which is right across the hallway. And yeah, you're free to go. Thank you for coming. <laughs>